On page 114, 115, excuse me, of the Builder's Guide to Accounting it begins chapter 10, which is accounting for materials. This gets a little bit complicated, so you got to read this carefully. Let's read the whole thing just to make sure we can understand it. This really is something that you can understand even if you're not an accountant. So it's probably really worth taking a look at closely. Direct costs, first thing on the page, are those related to the work you do and don't include other, other overhead or other expenses. As sales increase or decrease, so do direct costs and gross profits. The largest direct cost to a builder are subcontracts, materials, and labor. Materials include everything you buy that will be installed on your jobs, both material used from your yard inventory and material delivered directly to your job sites by the supplier. Freight charges on that material are direct costs because they're part of the cost of getting the material to the structure. Indirect costs are the expenses of taking a particular job that don't involve any work on the job itself. Indirect costs include freight, administrative payroll, and small tools. Anything not billed to a specific customer. There you go. They don't do the best job of explaining that there. The wording isn't the best, but I think that you've got the idea. Good under materials handling and control. The most professional builders pay a great deal of attention to materials handling and control. That's because about half of your direct costs will be for materials, and it's estimated that about 8 to 10 percent of labor costs on residential construction are spent just to move materials from the curb line to where they're installed. Yeah, man. 8 to 10 percent just to move materials from the curb into the building. You might want to know that someday. On page 116, left-hand column, fourth paragraph, volume buying is a big part of a good purchase plan. Still on page 16, on the left-hand column, go down to the last section. In bold print, it says controlling purchases. Your mix of jobs should keep your inventory moving steadily, but you need, to con but you need control over materials entering your yard from suppliers. Written purchase orders are the simplest control device. Let's go to a right-hand column on that same page, page 116. We'll go down to the second full paragraph. We're told that figure 10-1, of course that's on the next page there, shows a typical purchase order. A purchase order form should include the following information. There you go. All those bullets. I want you to highlight the bullet that says accounting copy. That's the second one from the bottom. To be matched to the invoice when received. Keep these in alphabetical order until the bills are paid. Check the prices on the invoice purchase on the invoice against purchase order prices. There you go. So that's a good plan there. We're going to go to page 118. The first thing on page 118 says summarize your purchase orders on a purchase journal. There's a sample one right there. Right hand column, first full paragraph, some builders use the purchase journal as a source document for accounting entries. Next paragraph, if your purchasing system requires that you use a purchase journal as well as an accounting document, here is the entry you must make each month to record purchases. And it kind of tells you that on the next page there. Let's still stay on page 119, left-hand column, halfway down, controlling inventory. Controlling inventory. Controlling your inventory requires a purchasing plan that's in line with a strict inventory level policy. How much do you need to keep on hand and of what materials? Lack of planning and control can leave you with too much or too little material in any given time. Having too much ties up working capital that can be better used, keeping too little on hand can cause expensive delays. You can't tell exactly what piece you'll need tomorrow or next week. Keep a reasonable amount of surplus, material, surplus materials on hand 
to save time and allow you to bring in more short-term contracts. There you go. Let's go to the next page. We're going to go to page 120. We're on the left-hand column. At the bottom it says Valuing Inventories. Inventories are usually valued on some type of cost basis. Since the methods used to report these sales profits and yields are all based on actual costs, job estimates are based on costs as well. So it's logical to maintain your inventories in the same way. There are three cost basis valuation methods worth considering. The right one for you depends primarily on the size of your average inventory. And there they are. You have specific cost, first in, first out, or last in, first out. Let's go to page 121, left hand column at the top. There are four major inventory categories. They should be distinguished from each other, since you may have to keep separate records unless all your materials fall into the same cat fall into the first category. You have raw materials, supplies, work in process, and finished goods. That's your four major inventory categories. Let's go down that same column, about halfway down, analyzing materials and inventory. There are two principal ratios used to judge whether or not the level of your inventory is too high or too low for the volume of work you do. One is the cost of goods sold to average inventories. The other is the sales to inventories. The sales to inventories ratio isn't a precise indication of the effectiveness because inventories are based on the cost of materials and sales are based on the, uh, materials plus profit. But you can use this ratio if sales are stable from month to month. We're told that a far more useful ratio is the cost of goods sold to average inventories. The cost of goods sold represents all direct costs adjusted for the change in inventory levels. Here how to, here's how to calculate. So you can take a look at that if you like. Let's go to the top uh, page uh, 121 on the right hand column. Go to the fourth line. Shown below are physical inventories based on the calendar year but partnerships and corporations can base their physical inventories on the fiscal year. Let's go about halfway down the page. Since there are four possible types of inventories, there are four variations on the ratio. So there you go. Make sure you can find those four ratios. As we go down to the bottom of the page, there's some bullets just above those bullets. There's a paragraph, and about halfway through that paragraph, we're told a high ratio can mean that you're maintaining too small an inventory and may result in lost sales. The correct level depends on your operation and its volume. Good inventory control does the following. Make sure you can find all those bullets, but you might want to draw you a little arrow because guess what? There's some more on the next page and you got to watch for that when you're taking the test. A lot of times it seems as though the test, uh, the test question writers will look for that type of thing and they'll understand that you may look at the bottom of one page, page 121 and think that's all there is. There's more on page 122. Let's go to page 125. This is chapter 11, payroll accounting. First sentence. Labor is the largest and most variable cost in building. Because of the nature of labor costs and the legal and practical needs for payroll keeping, you must keep complete records. Page 126, left-hand column, second paragraph, four ways to keep separate payroll records. Number one, pay a banker independent data service center to prepare it. Yeah. Number two, issue payroll checks from one, from the one general account and from the same check series. Checks in this account must be designed to handle payroll stub deductions. Number three, you can use the general account for both payroll and other payments, but use a special style of check. Number four is the one we like. Set up a separate payroll account with its own check style used only for payroll. You know, you got a lot of things out there that are based on payroll, and you, you don't have to turn over all your books if you need to turn over your payroll, say for an audit, a uh, workers comp audit or something like that. There you go. So let's peruse on through this book a little bit and we'll go to page 134. 
And we're told on page 134, you have a table. That second table is a clearing account. This is where you put your payroll taxes that you withhold. Let's go to that left-hand column, first full paragraph. It says figure 11-10 shows the flow of funds through clearing accounts such as payroll taxes withheld. On a gross payroll of $5,000, withholding taxes are $1,521 for the current month. This amount includes the tax liability on behalf of the employees, so it is deposited in the clearing account in the current month. You deposit those payroll taxes withheld in a clearing account. That's what you do. Let's go to the next page. Uh, actually, it's page 138. And there's a bullet on the bottom. It starts on the bottom page 137. Talks about all those forms that you have to fill out. And there they are on page 138. 941 is the one we have highlighted. That's the fourth one. That's where you put your income tax, your withholding taxes, your FICA. Okay. FICA, by the way, is a fancy word for Social Security and Medicare when they add them together. It stands for Federal Insurance Contribution Act. Let's go to the right-hand column at the top. Yeah, some types of payments to include on your 1099 are dividends or interest over $10 in one year and rents, commissions, and other types of miscellaneous income over $600 to pay someone other than your material suppliers. Let's go to page 141. We're going to talk a little bit about overhead. Yeah, ma'am. First thing, previous chapters examined direct costs, which vary with sales. But overhead expenses tend to remain fairly constant in spite of the changes in your sales volumes. Every builder has overhead expenses. Let's go to the last paragraph on the page. For example, there's a difference between labor, a direct cost, and union welfare expense, a variable expense. The labor that goes into a project is a necessary part of the production process. It generates income. The union welfare paid on that labor is once removed from the generation of income. It doesn't produce sales. Okay, So they're talking about that being overhead. Now there are variable expenses and fixed expenses. And there's a, um, a table on the top of page 142 that I want you to make sure that you can find. Now on the bottom right, what, what we suggest you do is you put the variable expenses in one color and the fixed expenses in the other color, and that helps you stay, uh, <clears throat> you know, helps you differentiate easier when you're trying to pass this test. Well, let's take a look right hand column at the bottom of the page. It says in bold print, variable overhead expenses. Here they all are. We've got small tools highlighted, union welfare. Collection expenses, travel and entertainment, all variable. All right. Then we've got fixed expenses, salaries and wages, payroll taxes, office supplies, utilities, consultants fees. Don't forget to flip that page. More, more fixed expenses on the next page. This is fixed overhead. Rent, depreciation, amortization, and so forth. Now what you're going to find is some of these things are can be variable and fixed, like insurance. See if insurance is in both of them. Well, appears to me it is. It depends on the type of insurance. It could be a variable, it could be a fixed. You'll just need to do your best to differentiate between those when you're taking that test. We're still on page 144, we're at the bottom left. We're talking about budgeting expenses and the last thing on the page says the budgeting process has three parts. Number one, you're going to prepare the budget. Number two, you're going to analyze the results. Number three, you're going to take action to control expenses. Let's uh, go to page 145 of the right-hand column at the bottom. The second paragraph from the bottom says, Another approach for variables would be to set budgeted amounts for expenses. There you go. Let's set those budgeted amounts. Let's flip over the page. On page 147, on the left-hand column at the bottom, once again, it taught, there's a discussion of variable expenses and fixed expenses. You might want to highlight that. Let's go to page 150, and we're going to look in the right-hand column and read the first paragraph, the first full paragraph. The cost of organizing a business can be high. No kidding. The cost should not be charged against the first year of operations. Instead, you should set up 
in an asset account or organizational expenses and write off the cost over a period of years. This process of spreading costs over a period of years is called amortization. There you go. It's handled like depreciation. All right, let's go to equipment records. That's chapter 13 on page 155. The largest, I'm going to read from the very top. The largest single investment that most builders make is for equipment. Your equipment is a fixed or long-term asset because you usually hold it for more than a year. You list your equipment on your balance sheet at its cost and depreciate it over its estimated life. The act of setting up an asset in the general ledger is called capitalization. Capitalizing. Skip a paragraph. Fixed assets aren't actually fixed, so the term long-term asset is often used. This is more accurate because it describes an asset with a long, useful life. Next paragraph. Long-term assets that you buy with borrowed money are listed at their total purchase price, even if you still owe your bank the major portion of the asset value. You show the liability as a long-term debt. The part of that debt that's payable within 12 months is recorded separately and called a current liability. You better make sure you know that anything that's current in accounting, like your current asset or your current liability, means within the last 12 months, or actually within the next 12 months. Last paragraph, current assets are expected to flow into cash within a year. Current liabilities include anything that is payable within a year. Let's go to the next page. Classifying fixed assets. Right hand column on page 156. Your balance sheet should show enough detail to reveal the position of your business. And there's all these, it says um, lumping several asset categories into one total obscures your investment in any single part. The following balance sheet categories, okay, are typical. So there you go. You got all these categories that you're going to separate your assets into. The last thing I want you to, I want you to highlight all those bullets, but make sure that you um, emphasize land, the last bullet. Includes the value of any land owned by the company. It must be kept separate from all others since tax law excludes land from depreciation. Did you hear me emphasize that? You do not depreciate land. You can depreciate real estate, which are improvements on land, but you can't depreciate land. Next paragraph. All long-term assets, except land, are depreciated. Okay, let's flip over to page 159 at the bottom right. The unit cost for equipment. Last bullet on the page, last sentence. Estimated average hours of use and idle time these are, what are they talking about here? This is unit cost. Established, if you're going to want to, I'm reading at the bottom of page 139, that last, I'm going to read that whole paragraph so we understand what we're talking about here. Unit cost for equipment. You want to establish an hourly cost for high value equipment. This is probably the second time you've seen this. You're going to establish an hourly cost for high value equipment. This requires certain information about each piece of equipment. You have your estimated average hours of use and idle time. You're going to have repair and maintenance time. You're going to have repair and maintenance costs. You're going to have cost of the equipment minus the estimated salvage value. You're going to have your estimated life of your equipment, the cost of storage, insurance, and taxes, operating costs, including gas, oil, and accessories. This information will help you put together more accurate estimates and analyze project costs. So, Let's say sometime in the future somebody asks you to figure out the hourly cost of a piece of equipment and they gave you a bunch of information. Make sure that you only utilize the information that's listed here. Okay, Labor, or, labor to operate a machine, I want you to realize, is not on here. 
It's not part of the hourly cost. Okay, right hand column at the top on page 160 in figure 13-4 under distribution by jobs. Record the amount of idle and repair time and the useful active time. Active time. Right hand column on page 161 at the bottom, let's look at depreciation. It's designed to let businesses recover the cost of buildings and equipment over the useful life. As you go to page 162, let's go to that, uh, uh, let's read that uh, paragraph. There are several ways, I'm at the top left on page 162, there are several ways to claim depreciation. Under the Macker's rules, that's modified accelerated cost recovery system, you may use a prescribed method or elect to use one of several straight line alternatives. But assets you begin you began depreciating under the old rules can continue under the old method until depreciation has been completed. Questions you must ask yourself before you begin to depreciate an asset are, is it depreciable? You can't claim depreciation on land, inventory, or intangible property. Okay, go ahead and read the paragraph 2, 3, and 4 on your own as well. After you do that, I want you to go to page 163, and I want you to find the depreciation methods. You have a straight line depreciation method. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to need to do a little calculation, but we're not going to do that right now. I'm going to give that to you on a separate video where we have some math, um, some math problems. We're going to do depreciation, we're going to do some payroll, and a couple other things that have to do strictly with business. Okay, okay. Let's say these are the class lives under the Macker's rules, this modified acceleration. This is another um, way you can depreciate. It tells you all these different types of, um, in, types of things, types of assets, and how many years you'll depreciate. For instance, everything that's in a five-year class is computers, typewriters, photocopiers, automobiles, light trucks. And by the way, anything that's a one-ton, like an F-350 or a 3500, uh, 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 Chevrolet is a one ton, so that would be considered a light truck. Look at that second and last bullet. Make sure you can find that. Residential, real property, like rental manufactured housing, you depreciate it over a 27 and a half year class life. Let's go to the bottom right on page 167 here. Bottom right on page 167, last paragraph. You can make another important election to expense property placed into service in a year. That means you write off a lump sum instead of taking the deduction over a number of years. To qualify, you've got to meet those rules there. So make sure that you can find those three bullets. And there's nothing on the next page here. Make sure you emphasize that last bullet. Once you make that election you, to uh, expense it, to reverse it requires permission from the IRS. All right, page 169 discusses amortization. Left-hand column, about four paragraphs down, amort uh, excuse me, four lines down, amortization spreads the cost of major expenses over time. Still on page 169, right-hand column, it says lease or buy. Equipment needed for single jobs. I'm, gonna, I'm reading from these bullets here. It says, uh, before those bullets, there's a paragraph that reads, the question of whether to buy equipment can be a major decision for any builder. It's sometimes to your advantage to lease equipment. You get the following benefits if you lease. So all those bullets are benefits if you lease. Go to the second bullet. Make sure you emphasize that one. Then an immediate tax deduction is available. Okay. Let's go to the last thing under the, on that page. The last sentence on that page. Under a lease purchase agreement, the full value of the equipment is included as an asset and the full, and the full liability, less equity, is listed as payable, both current and in the long term. Depreciation on the equipment can begin immediately as well. Bottom line is, if you're if it's lease purchase, you own it and you treat it as though you bought it. Still on that left-hand column on page 170, about two-thirds of the way down, sales and trade-ins. When equipment is sold, 
The books have to be cleared of all entries relating to that asset. This includes taking out the gross value of the asset and the accumulated depreciation on it. Okay, let's mosey on over to chapter 14, which is on page 173. And we're going to read the last paragraph on page 173. A good cash budget aims to do much more than this. Here's a list of what a good cash budget can accomplish. And you got three things there. Make sure you can find them, and you got some more on the next page. So you got about ten bullets there. You need to make sure you can find them all. That's what a good cash budget can do. Let's go to the right-hand column on page 174, and we're going to go down to the last paragraph. There's a sentence in that last paragraph on page 174 that I want you to highlight. See if you can find it. It's right in the middle of the paragraph. It says, try instead to reduce your current liabilities rather than increase your current assets. What does that mean? Well, let's read the whole paragraph just to make sure we know, give, us, give this sentence a little context. When you prepare your financial statement for a lender before applying for a loan, you may be tempted to accumulate current assets for a couple of months to improve your cash position. But accumulating current assets always results in piling up current liabilities. Try instead to reduce your current liabilities rather than increase your current assets. Sounds like a good plan to me. That's what they tell you to do in the book, and that's the way we're going to answer it on the test. Page 176, preparing a cash budget. Let's go to the second paragraph. There are two principal ways to prepare a cash budget or forecast. The cash movement method and the source and application of funds method. Next paragraph. The cash movement method involves budgeting only the flow of actual cash in and out of your business. Next paragraph. This method is especially valuable for builders who have wide variations in their business volume from month to month. There's another one called the source and application of funds method. It says it's more precise than the cash movement method. It assumes that you will attain a certain level of net income. There you go. Just some really good stuff. On page 178, we're going to figure a break-even point on the bottom right. This is another one of those math questions that we're going to put on that video on that business math video for you and it's on the right hand column at the bottom figuring a break-even point you reach a break-even point when your profits fall to zero let's go to the left hand column on page 179 we'll look at the first uh, full paragraph on the left hand column the break-even point has a very specific use it doesn't distinguish between the various yields of the different jobs, job types you do. It can't help you decide what kind of work you need to reach or anything like that. The break-even point doesn't encourage growth. It merely tells you the minimum sales you need to break even. It serves as a reminder to maintain a good cash budget and to better that goal. There you go. Let's take a look on page 181. You've got a table on page 181. What the table is telling us is the left-hand column is our accounting problem. And we've got a problem on the left-hand side and a solution on the right-hand side. For instance, the problem lapping. Cash is taken from the business by moving outstanding balances from one customer to another. you got a thief writing off the amount of cash taken as a bad debt. How do you solve that? Well, the way to prevent lapping is to insist on monthly aging list of all outstanding accounts. Sounds like a good plan. Okie dokie. As we flip through, we're going to be talking in chapter 15 about cost and expense records. And on page 188, we're told a, uh, objectives of the cost system. Finding the best way to keep track of job costs and expenses isn't easy. Every builder's operation is unique, and the right system is different for everyone. But knowing the objectives of a cost system should help you design procedures that will work well for you. A cost system should do the following. And just go ahead and highlight all those bullets. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh bullet, this is the second paragraph on the right-hand side, says identify overruns promptly okay so corrective action is taken uh, a procedure that tells you that you had the cost overruns last month or even last week is of little value you want to know immediately 
Still in that right hand column on page 188, let's go to the bottom, it's the second paragraph from the bottom, general expenses which don't apply directly to jobs. What you do is you allocate those among the jobs in progress. Okay, and a fast method for applying different deferral totals to a large number of general expenses is explained in chapter 16. Let's keep going. Let's see here. Let's go to page 190. We're in the left-hand column at the bottom. We're told that figure, last paragraph, 15.3 is a ratio analysis of direct labor. What they're doing here is they're comparing the actual hours it took your guys, your crew, to do something as it relates as it compares to what they call a standard. Maybe somewhere they've developed a standard for a certain number of blocks to be laid or square foot of paint to be put down or something like that. So they're comparing your actual labor to a standard and then they're coming up with a ratio. That's another one of those questions that you we're going to uh, cover on that business math video. Let's go to page 191, left-hand column, three paragraphs from the bottom. Deferred income is neither a current nor a long-term liability. It is a deferred credit, a third distinct classification of the operations balance sheet. Let's go to page 193, left-hand column, second paragraph. Direct costs should be carefully monitored and assigned to the proper job and regularly compared with the estimate that served as the basis for your original cost summary. Only by following and comparing carefully can you expect to really control costs and identify trouble areas before they become disasters. Don't want any disasters. No, sir. Okay, we're going to cruise on through to page 201, and we're going to be talking about accounting for overhead.